the importance of that many microphones. Three o'clock. <laughs> so, um, welcome. Uh, I'm Henning. I'm opposed to what many people think. I did not just write PF. I also did a little bit more. And uh, one of the things is uh, OpenBGPD, which just turned 10 years, which is a great opportunity to recycle a talk from, I mean, to look back. <laughs> and well, so that's what we are going to do. Um, there's a nice picture from the birthday party. The cake was very yummy. So, background. Um, who am I? I run an ISP, which explains why I care about BGP. Um, the company goes back to 1996 um, in a slightly different form. So we are an ISP since 1998. That's 16 years by now? Holy crap. Um, heavily using OpenBSD, um, large scale since about 2000. And uh, around that time, our core orders were running OpenBSD, which is good, but they were also running Zebra for BGP, which is not good. Welcome, find a seat. I'll happily wait for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as I said, running OpenBSD, which was good, but uh, also running Zebra for BGP, which is not good. So Zebra, um, back then, pretty much was the, the, only, the only BGP implementation to run on a Unix system. There were some tiny projects that you couldn't really use, but that was the one at that time. Um, it was written by, by a guy from Japan, which in itself is not a problem at all, except that he wrote all the commands in the code and all the documentation in Japanese. And well, these days, I managed to speak 10 to 15 words of Japanese. Back then, it was zero. So I couldn't quite make sense of that. Um, if it's been only that, I had been fine. But unfortunately, the software design was utterly wrong. Do I have this on the next slide, or do I have to turn this out? Yes, I do. So um, that Zebra thing is a prime example on how not to design a BGP daemon. First, first mistake. You know this famous saying, right? There are three kinds of bugs. My bugs, your bugs, and threats. <laughs> you can make this even worse, cooperative threats. Um, combined with the model of a central event queue, this becomes much, much, much worse. So um, a session coming up or a session going down is an event. Receiving a routing update is an event. Um, in BGP, you have to send keep alives every now and then to inform your peers that you're still alive. Now, the event I need to send a BGP keep alive also goes into the centralized event queue, which is processed in a FIFO order. So if your central event queue is very busy because you just lost sessions and they sent you another 500,000 routes, well, that event I need to send a keep alive to my other peer kind of starts at the end, and you don't send the keep alive, at least not in time. So what happens? Your peer drops the session because he thinks you're dead. The session pretty quickly will come up again and he'll send you another 500,000 routes, making the thing worse. So <clears throat> not the smartest design. And as I said, the documentation was in Japanese. So um, I tried to cope with that. I uh, patched out the worst bugs because the thing also liked to crash. Uh, I got it reasonably stable at least, but it was still dog slow. And again, we were talking 10 years ago where we didn't have the I'll solve the problem by throwing hardware at it solution that everybody's employing today. So it was still slow. A um, little bit later, actually after, after I started BGPD, the author tried to commercialize it. And this went as well as it usually goes when an author tries to commercialize open source software. It's dead. Um, some frustrated users tried to fix it by forking it, calling it Quagga, which is still around. But, um, well, the design is still wrong, so this was entirely fruitless. So, starting with BGP, the biggest problem, Theo got me drunk in Calgary. <laughs> 
Oh, that's, that's what you think. <laughs> and someone on that evening, I was there to do the OpenBSD release work for, for whatever release it was 10 years ago. And this, this was a release that was kind of painful because we, we had some last minute bugs and after we got it out of the door, we went drinking and this is what happened. Um, I made the mistake of mentioning how fed up I am with that Zephyr thing and I mentioned, well, I could write my own, but this is so much work and I don't know how to do it and I can't code properly anyway and I don't know how sockets work, well, that's a lie, but um, <laughs> it was clear this was a monster task, but well, Unfortunately, he kept nagging, and uh, in late 2003, this is like two or three months after, after that getting drunk thing, of course, I never ever got drunk again. <laughs> you just earned the first banana. <laughs> so so uh, two or three months later, I started hacking. Um, Basically, by locking myself into my office and not leaving it for a week or so. No, that's not true. I went home to sleep, but um, it was interesting times. Um, I started hacking by writing the, the session handling because, well, that's where Zebra sucked most. And at the point where I had a daemon that could establish sessions to other BGP speakers and establish the you know parameter negotiation and keep the session alive by sending the keep alive and ignoring all, all payload, like ignoring all routing data. Um, I started to show the prototype around to a couple of people and there was one guy at that time without an OpenBSD account, Claudio, who uh, was interested and uh, joined. So we kept hacking on that outside the OpenBSD tree. In December of the same year, we imported the almost working at that point BGP into the OpenBSD tree and at the same time imported Claudio as well, which I think was a smart move. Yes, very smart. And well, so the protocols. Couldn't argue with the order here. But anyway, the border gateway protocol BGP is defined in an RFC which only has two major bugs, not the protocol, the RFC. Um, BGP is used between ISPs, well, and for spam synchronization now, but the intent is, is that ISPs talk BGP to each other to inform each other which networks are reachable through them. So everybody tells his neighbor, hello, if you want to reach 10 slash 8, send it my way. And they'll announce it on to their peers, upstreams, downstreams. Since that would not scale by announcing all the networks individually or looking at them individually. They're subsummarized into autonomous systems and typically one ISP is one AS. Some big ones are more than one, but this is typically the result of mergers or Canadian bullshit. <laughs> <coughs> um, in BGP, you're not looking at routes in the sense of IP really, like you're not looking at what looks, it doesn't look like a trace route because that would be too complicated and too static. You describe the path is by just describing the AS, the autonomous systems that you pass to reach a certain destination network. The BGP speakers typically announce the networks that are directly connected to them, that's smaller setups, or that they learned through some kind of internal routing protocol, that's the little bigger setups. Um, depending on configuration, you might also announce networks that you learn from your peers. AS paths are just written by, by uh, writing the uh, AS numbers from left to right. So if our destination is cvs.openvsd.org, that's an AS22512. And from my network, this is reached by first going through 174, then through 812, and then reaching those. Kind of easy. BGP is actually kind of simple. It only knows about four message types. It has been slightly extended later, but originally it was only four message types. There's open, which is sent right after you establish the GCP connection. Um, the open messages contain things like, this is my AS number. Uh, these are my timing values for, I expect 
uh, keep alive every so often and I'll drop the connection after 90 seconds without seeing a keep alive. We have set keep alive that just tells you up here, hi, I'm still alive. We have updates which contain the actual routing information. And we have notifications which really are fatal errors. When you receive a notification from your peer, you have to drop the connection and drop all the routes you learned from him. So, designing the BGP daemon. Um, for some interesting reason, I thought threads were not an option. So, <laughs> I went for uh, three processes. One of them is the session engine, which does nothing else but making sure that the goddamn sessions stay up and the keeper lives are sent in order. And to make sure that this session engine never gets too busy, it will never ever look at the update messages. It just takes those and passes them on to a separate process which deals with the actual payload, with the content, with the routes, with the, what PGP is all about, and uh, called this the route decision engine. And that's the one that takes up all your memory because it holds the BGP tables. And that one is the one that decides which of the routes it learned, like the path is to a, to a given destination, which one of those is best. The third process is the parent process, which is the one that talks to the kernel. It forks off the others. Yeah, that's what it mostly is. It's also just the IPsec stuff, but we'll get to that later. That's the model. This is an awesome picture I made 10 years ago. And I think it only has one mistake. So the master process, the parent process, runs as root. It needs root permissions to adjust the kernel routing table. Surprise, as a regular user, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, it needs root to do IPsec and TCP MD5 to protect the sessions. We'll get to that later. It forks off the two other processes. The, the processes talk to each other over socket pairs. The master passes the configuration information to the other processes, so it parses the config file and sends the config over. The session engine talks to all the peers, sets, sends the actual routing updates to the session engine, and of course it has to inform the session engine when the peer goes away, so that goes over too. It does all the magic of deciding which route is best, and eventually feeds that to the master process. Now, of course, you don't want to feed the master process a route that, actually, that is unreachable for some reason. So it asks the master process to uh, validate that the IP next stop, that's an IP address, the gateway, is actually reachable. The master knows the kernel routing table and verifies you can reach it. The uh, BGP employs something that we do all over the place in OpenBSD, especially today. It's the principle of least privilege. Run everything with the lowest privileges uh, that are really, really required. The route decision engine doesn't need anything special. Um, so it runs as underscore BGPD. And um, it shoots to var empty, which, as the name indicates, is empty except for a logging socket. The session engine needs root to bind to port 179. Uh, we'll get to how we worked around that later. The parent needs root. There's no way to work around that. As said, to modify the kernel routing table, you need root. And this is not just to open the routing socket. This is checked on each and every routing update. Um, it also needs root for the IPsec close, obviously. As said, to bind to a low port, you need root permissions. And since we don't want to run the session engine, which after all is the network facing part of BGPD uh, to run this root, um, we don't have the session engine opening that socket. We have the parent opening it and then pass the file descriptor over to the uh, session engine. The parent has to keep track of which file descriptors the session engine has opened, because otherwise you try to open them twice, and that leads to very interesting results that took a while to get right. And now that the session engine does not have to do anything special anymore, we can happily run that as underscore BGPD as well, which is an unprivileged user, of course, and uh, change itself to var empty as well. So 
<laughs> I'm getting back to threads here. We don't want them. But if we want to have one process talking to a lot of peers, we obviously cannot go for the classic way of dealing with sockets because they'll block. And we will not read from others when one, well, is blocking. So the obvious solution is go for non-blocking sockets, which sounds very easy but has consequences. When you call, for example, write or send message, it doesn't really matter here, anything that writes to the socket, the same is true for reads, but let's use writes as an example. When you call write, send message, and the like on a, on a blocking socket, and it cannot get rid of the entire payload at once, it will bl it'll block until it's done, and when the syscall returns, you know that all data has been written out, or an error has occurred. There's no other way. On a non-blocking socket, that syscall will return as soon as it would block on a blocking socket, which can mean that it wrote half of the payload out and the other half you have to retry later. So you have to do all the buffer management yourself. For that, I wrote a framework which I called iMessage for internal messaging. Um, on top of a buffer API, which hides, which hides the, I have to write the remaining 15 bytes later. It's hiding all the complications of dealing with non-blocking sockets. This really, really, really paid out. Um, I just did this because it felt right. Um, however, as it later turned out, this was very useful to many, many other demons that we wrote later in OpenBSD. There's a list here which is certainly incomplete. Um, these are the ones using iMessage in OpenBSD, which were easy and obvious to find. Um, I know of a couple of other projects outside OpenBSD using the framework now. So that was a good idea, lesson learned. Proper abstraction, proper API, it might get reused. The internal messaging, of course, is a core component in any form of privilege separation. If you have privilege separation, you have multiple processes that need to talk to each other somehow. And instead of reinventing the wheel all the time, do it once and do it right. Um, today, Wikipedia has 66 different message types, so it's very heavy on messaging. That's more than open message. And uh, the iMessage framework initially planned just for the communications between the three processes, like inside that daemon, uh, turned out it was pretty easy to, to just run this over different kinds of sockets, like a TCP connection or a Unix domain socket. So BGP control, which as the name indicates, is a separate little control program, talks to BGPD using exactly the same framework. You could even talk TCP to a different machine. Is it Endian safe? No, it isn't. But that would be easy to fix. <coughs> So, let's look at the session engine again. Um, a set maintains the sessions, makes sure they never ever drop. Once the session is established, it takes care of the keep alive handling. It receives the keep alive from the neighbors, and of course, if it doesn't see the keep alive, it has to drop the connection, so it has to run a bunch of timers. It does not deal with routing or route messages at all, it just passes those on. And it is very, very lightweight. Typically, it'll consume less than five megabytes of, of RAM. If you see it consuming more memory, that means that one of your peers is very, very slow and it buffers a lot. That typically means you're talking to a Cisco. <laughs> no kidding. I mean, if you're spending, if you're spending 200,000 euros on a router, you cannot expect to get a CPU worth more than $2. So, the route decision engine, that's where the magic happens, maintains what in BGP land is called the routing information base, that's shitloads of tables. Um, last but not least, the two most important ones are the prefix tables, prefixes are the routes, it's the 10 slash 8 is a prefix, and the AS paths that are associated with the prefixes, but you can have like you have one prefix and typically multiple AS paths to it, so that's kept in separate tables and heavily interlinked. The filters run there. Um, you don't want to accept your downstream customer to announce you the routes to Microsoft.com. Well, maybe you do. <laughs> um, it has to take a decision on which of the paths it learned is the best for a given prefix. And uh, it also has to generate the update messages to feed the routing information to your peers. 
the layout there um, is many, many tables which are heavily linked. Um, the goal here is to avoid table walks. Once again, um, this is learning from mistakes others did. Do I have to mention Cisco again? <laughs> In uh, other commercial BGP implementations, it's very common to have a periodic, like a cron job every 15 seconds or a minute or so, to walk the tables and look for changes. This, of course, is horribly inefficient, which is very nice when you work on a $2 CPU. Um, we did not want to do the same mistake. Um, this doesn't need any periodic table scanning at all, and is very, very fast. The decision process, um, keep in mind when I say the best route, it's the best route according to that algorithm. It's not necessarily the best route in what we would consider the best route. So first step in the decision process, the decision process always, always compares two routes and does that multiple times until they figured out which is the best one. First step, you check whether that route is actually valid, like you can reach it, VIP next stop is reachable. Then there's a parameter called local preference. You can set this in your configuration. The bigger, the better. If you don't manually interfere, those will be equal, which then means we go on and compare the AS path length, shorter is better. Um, these days, they are often very equal because everybody's at the same peering points, at least in Europe. Peering, you might have heard about this, <laughs> Canadians, <laughs> North Americans. We're finally getting there. I know. Um, if they're equal, we are looking at the origin. Origin describes whether the route has been learned from a peer or coming out of an internal routing protocol, the lower the better. Um, then there's something called the multi-exit discriminator. The idea here is if two networks peer in, in multiple locations, you can use the MED to uh, indicate the peer, drop me the traffic at this point and not at the other where we are peering. Um, traditionally, this is only comparable between the same neighboring ass, but there have been creative uses of that, so most BGP implementations today allow you to compare those between different AS as well. External BGP is cooler than internal, so that your own BGP speakers talking to each other don't consider uh, each other the best. Of course, that's a loop, obviously. Weight is an extension we did. Um, this is to tip a routing decision. As said, the AS path is often the same these days, especially when you talk, talk about routes from your continent. Um, you want to, for traffic engineering to make sure that your uplinks are loaded kind of equally. You want a way to tip the decision towards one a little bit without taking the hard decision by setting the local path. So um, that's why we added weight. Bigger is better when they are equal otherwise. You can influence which one is preferred in that case. The rest becomes a little bit academic. Um, the H step is route age. Older is better because that means it's more stable. This is an extension we did. Uh, it's actually off by default because it's non-standard. And if we still could not take a decision, we are getting into bullshit land because we have to take a decision. The lowest BGP ID wins. What's the BGP ID? It's the lowest IP address on the router, numerically. That's a very good factor to decide which route is best. Afterwards, you're looking at the cluster list. Ignore it, doesn't make sense at all. If that still doesn't lead to a decision, the numerically lowest peer IP address wins. And if that doesn't work, it'll spit out that error message and die, because that's unreachable. This is all about weight, which I already explained. Awesome here. So the parent process, as I said, that's responsible for talking to the kernel. Um, it has to do the next stop validation. I keep writing on this because this is actually more complex than thought. Once again, you don't want to install routes into your kernel where the next stop is not reachable when you do have an alternate route in BGP. The cart problem got fixed with about five minutes, right? What got fixed? Which card bug? 
several platforms for connecting to peer list that consist of five bytes. So that might have been the one. That made it fully loose, though? Or something? That might have been, yes. That's half a year ago. Come on. <laughs> I don't remember this, to be honest, but <laughs> apparently. So to do so, the parent process maintains its own copy of the kernel routing table. That means that on startup, using the syscall interface, it fetches the entire kernel routing table, which hopefully is small before BGP runs. It typically doesn't have all that many entries. However, if you're in a big network and your internal routing protocol is up, it might be not all that small. Um, on top of the routing table, it needs the interface list because you do not want to install routes pointing to an interface which is down. And uh, to keep that copy in sync, you don't want to call, call into the kernel every time you want to validate an extra because that's kind of expensive. That's why we have the copy. And it's obvious that it has to be kept in sync. And this is why we listen to the routing socket. The routing socket is the interface to the kernel routing table. Any change you do to the kernel routing table is a message on the routing socket, and the kernel will relay that message to all other listeners on the routing socket. So everybody has a chance to, to kept informed about changes. Um, that also means that if you manually install routes into the kernel routing table, we will notice and cope with that. Once again, I have to point this out because certain other vendors don't get this right certain other vendors. Um, the same goes for the interfaces. Interface link state changes and the like also get announced on the routing sockets and that table is kept in sync the very same way, which also means that um, since we are, we are looking at the link state, we will notice when you pull the cable, we don't have to wait for the keep alive timeout to kick in. We can remove those routes immediately and replace by alternate ones. And once again, thanks to that, we don't have to walk the next dot table every couple of seconds and check whether they are still reachable like certain other vendors. So um, this, this copy of the kernel routing table can be coupled and decoupled from the kernel. Why? Because I could. <laughs> It was really, really for, for, during the development phase, it was really, really, really convenient. Um, if, you, if you run BGP as a route server or for something which is not into routing at all, like BGP spam distribution, yeah. there is just no point to insert something to the kernel routing table. Like the, the blacklist to the kernel routing table, no. The next, the next talk would be heading specific server and you will base server. Uh, <laughs> No, you don't want that. So there are certain uses, that's one, and route servers are the other typical use, where you don't want to update the kernel routing table at all. So you need a way to run decoupled anyway. And since it was so easy to couple and decouple, um, to couple and decouple at runtime, I implemented that. Uh, it was surprisingly fast. It's under 10 seconds usually with the full table, which means half a million prefixes these days uh, on a not too beefy machine. And uh, on an AMD64 machine, we just need about 32 megabytes for 400,000 routes, which I find quite impressive, once again, because certain other vendors who also apply arbitrary memory limits in their hardware don't get this right, not remotely. There's a big debate right now in Nanoc because uh, several commercial routers uh, will not be able to deal with more than half a million prefixes, which we are just hitting. So it's kind of obvious that these TCP sessions between the BGP speakers are critical. If somebody manages to attack this TCP session and make a drop, you will delete all the routes you learn from your peer. If the attacker manages to do this with all your upstreams, you're offline. So this is not good. Um, there was this, when was this? This was around the same time, 2004, 2005, the RST attack on, on TCP, where, you, where an attacker could smuggle an RST onto an existing TCP <coughs> connection by guessing the window correctly. Um, this is especially bad for BGP, as said, because it can take you offline. So you want to protect your TCP sessions. Um, there is a standard for that, TCP MD5, which basically just adds an MD5 signature 
over the payload and a shared secret. And we even had code for that from, from around 4.4 BSD. This code was very impressive because there's no way that ever worked. <laughs> so uh, after looking at that, the decision was clear, just delete it because fixing that was impossible, almost impossible, pointless because it was horrible. I'm not saying we'll joy again. Oh, damn, I did. Um, since, and since the uh, signatures in TCP MD5, this is somewhat similar to, to uh, IPsec AH, right? So we implemented this as a kind of special, special algorithm in, in IPsec using the very same user land kernel interfaces, which also means that I had to add a PF key interface to BGP. The PF key is the standards bodies defined interface between user land and kernel to modify IPsec flows and keys. And well, since this has been designed by a committee, which means by people who never wrote a single line of code or did so 25 years ago, unfortunately forgot about it, it's horrible. Um, that was super painful. It claims I drank a lot of beer, but since I never drank again after talking to Theo about this, this can't be true. <laughs> the, uh, the, one of the advantages of having gone through that pain means since I already have the PF key interface, well, TCP MD5 is nice, but we all know MD5 is not exactly the algorithm of choice today, right? So since we already have the interface, how about implementing real IPsec? Oh, before I have to poke on FreeBSD. FreeBSD at the same time instead of just taking our code, once again, had to reinvent the wheel and write their own TCP MD5 implementation. This was brilliant. They did attach MD5 signatures to outgoing TCP packets, even correctly, but they never bothered to verify incoming ones. So what again was the point? You will not detect any modification? Well, Your peer might. Your peer might detect that your packet had been tampered with, yes, but you cannot possibly figure out that the packets from, your, from the peer to you were tampered with. So entirely pointless. Another, another completely unexpected way to screw this up has been, has been demonstrated by a certain commercial vendor. Surprise, it's Cisco. They do the MD5 signature check before doing all the cheap checks. Like, um, you kind of want to check the sequence number fitting the window before starting to do the comparably expensive MD5 check. Well, they do it in the other order, or at least they did. Which, once again, is especially smart when you are shipping $2 CPUs and 200,000 euro routers. Apparently, at least at that time, only Juniper and OpenBSD got this right, and I find this really, really surprising because this is a kind of simple problem. But, well, if you have to buy a commercial router, don't pick a Cisco. So, um, as said, since I already had to write the PFT interface, doing real IPsec was kind of easy. So first step, do it with uh, static keys. Um, not too hard to do, all that needs to be done, BGPDS to load BSAs, which is good pretty much the keying information, the password, the key, into the kernel, and BGPD will set up the flows. So no <laughs> manual configuration whatsoever because BGPD has all the information. It knows the IP addresses of the peers and it knows which ports the connection is on, right? Um, turns out that Juniper can do this as well, and uh, we are perfectly compatible, that works fine. At that time, I actually had, had a session from Hamburg in Germany where, where I am, to the Juniper lab somewhere in the US because them, they were also interested in making sure this is uh, compatible and this worked really brilliantly and just fine. On Cisco's you still can't do this. Perhaps you can buy some feature set to enable this. Well, who knows? Um, unfortunately, and I really hope for this to change but this didn't happen, this is not being used in practice. In practice, most TCP sessions don't even have MD5 signatures. Most network admins think they don't have to protect those sessions. They are safe because they are only on one network segment. Right.
Nothing I can do about it. Pardon? Layer 2 of POS and VM. One. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't throw food. So, um, static key IP is nice, but you run with the same keys for years. So, how about going for Ike, uh, the internet key exchange? Um, at that time, I mean, ISA KMPD, because we're talking Ike v1. We have not extended this to Ike v2, have we? I don't think so. Do we have to? Isn't this transparent to BGP? Yes, it is. No, yes, no. Almost. Should be. No, this should just work. Should just work. Anyway, so ISA KMPD, the, the Ike key management demon we already had, can do the keying for us and everything. Um, instead of the, the, the usual setup where it also takes care of the flows, BGPD does that because, once again, it has all that information. Um, BGPD just asks the kernel for an unused pair of SPIs, which are kind of identifiers for those flows, and uses them, sets up the flows. And um, since ISA KMPD only has to do the keying, you don't have to, go, don't have to get into the keynote nightmare, which is their policy engine thing. Um, it's even better, ISA KMPD in that setup doesn't need any configuration. You just have to copy the generated key files over, obviously, and run ISA KMPD minus KA. And then <laughs> you can tell that I gave this talk in Japan last. This is cheers in Japanese. Then you can go for beer while the other commercial router administrators still fight their setups. Um, Without any form of protecting these TCP sessions, big TCP windows are very risky because it becomes easy for an attacker to guess a sequence number that fits into your window. So in BGPD, we keep the TCP window at the default setting, which I think is 16K. I think it's 16K. However, when there is a form of protecting the TCP session, like, like TCP MV5 or IPsec, we will raise that window to 64K. The conclusion is IPsec makes your network faster. Um, since I also had some bits in PF, uh, there is integration with PF and BGPD. Um, as mentioned, BGP is very efficient to distribute prefixes, networks, or IP addresses. Like a slash 32 prefix is just an IP address. So this can be used in many creative ways. Our talks are really in the wrong order, <laughs> unfortunately. Yes. But uh, the, the most obvious, most prominent, and actually thought about from the beginning use is exactly what Peter talked about, distributing uh, spam the blacklists and white lists. Adding this feature exclusively yeah. said including spam the blacklists. Yep. And it was about five or seven years before I thought of this. My uh, before I thought of my idea. You were slow. <laughs> <laughs> but but. I you because I did. I was about to add this. Opposed to me, he did it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, the, uh, the PF integration in BGPD, um, BGPD can talk to, to PF and add prefixes it learned that the filter language matches into, into a PF table. And in PF, those tables can be used for pretty much everything, right? You can use them to drop packets from any IP address in that table or any network in that table. You can use them to redirect them to SpamD or redirect them to your real mail server or redirect them to your favorite victim. <laughs> you can also use that to do quality of service processing. So all prefixes you learn from a specific peer put into a very, very low bandwidth queue and tell your, cust tell your you customers. Can do this for Netflix if you want more money from them. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> well, you can. Netflix is a good example, or YouTube, or whatever. Um, you can also use this to, to uh, slow down a specific, specific peer network and tell your customers, I already told you he's slow. Is it? 
you, it, you could use the, you, you use can the app for use for, for, for good or bad. For good or bad. It's, you yes. Have the yes. We just supply the tools. <laughs> well, there there is no way to prevent that kind of bad use, and I honestly think there is we, there's no justification to even try to prevent that. I mean, we provide software. Period. So um, route labels. We, um, I extended the kernel routing tables to be able to attach a label to a route. A label. Um, is, well, a string, kind of, which really means it's just a bunch of bytes which you can attach to a route, store in the kernel routing table, and other daemons, other users can see this label and um, act based on that extra information that you attach to the route. So, for example, you can tag um, all routes that you receive from a specific neighbor AS with the name of that ISP, and in the kernel routing table, you'll see, well, this is a good example because they don't match, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, you, if you look at the kernel routing table, it'll print out the label for you. And in the very same way, other demons can see that label and act based on it. And I'm running out of time here. Um, PF can also filter based on these labels. So you can drop all traffic from that ISP or as said, put them into a queue, which coincidentally is called really slow. This combining this BGP information with PF is really, really powerful because suddenly you have BGP information to take routing, uh, sorry, to take filtering decisions on or these QoS decisions or whatever. PF is very, very powerful in that. Like just one example, you can limit the number of connections source IP addresses can open to your backend service based on which AS number they are coming from, which, which, which ISP they are coming from. So if you get all your attacks from a specific ISP in a third world country, the US, um, you can limit the number of connections. Those can open to 10, like each of the IP addresses in, in this network, while the rest of the world can happily open as many as they want. Um, <coughs> when you're fighting large scale distributed denial of service attacks, this is extremely powerful. I made a lot of use of that. CARP. We made BGPD aware of the CARP master backup state, which is kind of simple because that's the link state for a CARP interface. Um, sessions that are marked as depending on a CARP interface are forcefully held in idle state while the CARP interface is not mastered. They won't even try to reach the neighbor. And when the CARP interface becomes master, they will immediately try to connect to the neighbor, which means that the fail over time decreases dramatically. It works the other way around as well. BGPD can uh, influence the demotion counter in CARP. This is to make sure that a freshly rebooted router doesn't become CARP master because it actually has all the routes. IPv6, my favorite topic. Please just read the commit message. I have nothing to add. But I mean, seriously, 128 bits of addressing are not enough. So we are adding another 32. So we have 160 bit addresses. But then on the socket, we only have space for 128 bits. But on those where we are adding those 32 bits, we have two bytes on zero by definition. So we can use those two bytes to store the lower two bytes of the extra scope ID. The upper 60 bit of the scope ID will always be zero, right? No, there is no such guarantee. Give me a break. <laughs> Another example, this function in BGPD takes, uh, takes a network and uh, takes a net mask and gives you the prefix length. So 255.255.255.0 leads to 24 because it's slash 24, right? This is the IPv4 version, which only has four lines of code because the default route is a special case. I tried to show you the IPv6 version, but it unfortunately does not, fit the does not fit the screen here. It's much longer, and it's incomprehensible. 
To most of you, this looks like line noise, doesn't it? It does to me almost. So, filters. Um, you don't want to accept random prefixes announced by peers. As said, you don't want Mr. Small Guy announced to you that, hi, I'm Netflix. Well, maybe you do. <laughs> 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 Typically, you don't. So, um, given my background, I tried to make the filter language as PF-like as possible. But that means one big filter rule set, last match wins, which was a mistake in PF already, uh, opposed to all the other not all, but opposed to most other implementations, specifically the commercial ones, the filter language is a designed language and not an accident that happened along the way. Um, the filters are specifically important on exchange points because everybody peers for the route service, thus putting a lot of trust into the route service. On some exchange points, the filters are automatically generated from the IRR databases um, typically on exchange points, they're either automatically generated from the IRR databases or they don't filter. There basically is no middle ground. Um, we're still doing what? Three IXs in Canada are still doing this by hand. At least three. Uh, there is no middle ground on sane IXs. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's ridiculous and of course it doesn't scale. I said, we're getting there. Yes. <laughs> you're, really you're, you're getting taught how the internet is designed. So that, that leads to very, very big filter sets. I don't have current numbers, but the, uh, the D6 filter set, D6 is the exchange point in Frankfurt, being the biggest in the world, uh, they were at it's something like 300,000 filter rules, which is kind of massive. So since we went for this one sequential big uh, uh, rule set, you have to, since it's last match wins, you have to walk them all. And this is a performance problem. So it would, a performance problem. It would be much better to have smaller filter blocks which are then applied on a per peer basis. Unfortunately, we didn't go that way. Um, my desire to make this PF like in this case really went way too far. And the filter performance really is our biggest problem. And this cost us a lot of deployments. When we came up with OpenBGPD, many, many, many exchange points immediately jumped onto the train and started deploying them. And a fair share of them now went on to something else because our filters are too slow. I was kind of surprised to learn that we still have 30% market share on, on exchange points. Oh, market share. <laughs> you get the idea. So that was a mistake. Um, I have to add something else because everybody asks for portable versions of, of BGP and blah, blah, blah. Um, a Unix machine does not suddenly become a good router just by adding a BGP speaker. Um, we did not just do the BGP thing in user land and be done with it. We extended the kernel to it. We extended the kernel routing table. We added OSPF and OSPF6 speakers. We have a DVMRPD for multicast routing, which is completely irrelevant in practice. And we even wrote, <laughs> I didn't do it, we even wrote a RIPD for those who cannot let RIP go. RIP is a very old routing protocol which doesn't even know about net masks. RIP2 does. RIP2 does, okay. Still, it's horrible and you don't want to run it. And as I mentioned, we had a lot of changes in the kernel. We added route priorities, we have multipath routes now for load balancing, we have multiple routing tables and and routing domains, which is a separate talk. Uh, we even have an MPLS stack and the associated label distribution protocol daemon. I didn't do that either, but I absolutely welcome that. Another argument we are frequently being confronted with is the hardware versus software router. So if you go to vendor C or vendor J, spend a lot of money, you get a little box and think you have a hardware router. This is, in most cases, just not true. Most of the so-called hardware routers are just PC-like architectures running software. There basically is no difference. To get a hardware router that does the packet processing in a separate data pane, separated from the control pane, you have to spend at least 100,000 euros. That's what, 150,000 Canadian. So 
up until somewhere around 10 gigabits, software routers are not really a problem. They reach the limit there and you want some headroom, so if you actually handle 10 gigabits, you want to run one of the big things, but most sites handle way, way less traffic. So for all those cases, the PC running up and the thing of PHP is fine. The limit, of course, keeps increasing because the hardware is getting faster and we keep tuning stuff. So I suspect there's nobody in this room who would have a problem being limited to 10 gigabits on the core router. I suspect I might be wrong. The flexibility you get from running an OpenBSD box instead of one of the commercial routers is so much higher. Um, the, the case that kills it alone for me is the ability to run TCP, to, to run TCP dump to diagnose problems. Um, the, other, the other thing is that you can just install your favorite monitoring to a route modification to, I mean, it's a Unix box. You install whatever you want. So the flexibility you get is much better. And it's true that you know you can run TCP dump on a Juniper router. On a Juniper, yes. On a Cisco, you can't. So, status. I'm running out of time anyway. The actual BGP daemon is rock solid. I have not seen it dying in at least five years in my setup. The only reports of it dying we got were really, I can't even remember a single one. Not for normal use cases, certainly not. There, there were some that probably more worked on recently. That, was that must be bizarre. bizarre, meaning IPv6? No. no <laughs> like, 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 <laughs> even, even more bizarre. Sure. Yes? Uh, I run OpenBGP. Uh, there was maybe, I'm going to say it was about a year ago or something. One day there was some writes came in that completely shafted it. I remember that's right. Mm -hmm. I don't right. remember exactly what it was, and there was a specific no. version, and I, it was kind yes. of and there was, there was one alleged route being announced by someone in Italy. No, your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, everybody's everybody's cousin in Italy. So it was your cousin. <laughs> and <laughs> and you're, you're right, we, we did not handle this correctly either. All the others didn't either. Um, I got away with it because the, the path is where this route came in, the others filtered this out for me already. But yes, you're right, so there was one case. However, it's still rock solid. Um, what I'm really trying to come down to, the, the, reli blah, the reliability is at least on par with the commercial vendors. That's interesting because that bug was there from day number one on. Maybe it was what, what, built, what route it was coming in with, I don't know what, but that did protect it. You might have, it you somehow got lucky, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but this is actually a good point. With, uh, with OpenBSD and OpenBGPD, it's much easier to have, to have two routers in a, in a failover setup, which is hard to impossible with the commercial vendors. Um, we are pretty much feature complete. That includes BGP, v MPLS, VPNs, and multiple multiple RIPs, which is basically uh, router virtualization, kind of. Uh, don't make me explain, I'm out of time. Um, it is in use by many ISPs and exchange points worldwide. Actually, there's, there's one very, very big ISP using it internally. They showed me their they showed me their RIP with millions and millions of entries. I was very impressed. Um, so it's not just small ISPs, it's also being used by the multinational giants you all know. I'm not allowed to tell names here. Um, of course, acquisition operation is much, much, much cheaper than buying the commercial ones. And there is commercial support available. <laughs> by the way, Paul is a consultant. He forgot to mention this in his, in his presentation. <laughs> so, that's it. Any questions? Just to add, it's like 20% of the ISPs in the world use uh, OpenBGP with Cloud Storage. 20% of all ISPs yeah, in the world? 30, 30 something using uh, Quagga. Uh, then there's uh, Berg, like 17%. OpenBGP and Cisco have some, I'm not sure, but I don't remember exactly. Not 
What's that? IXP, Internet Exchange Points. There was a video a while back on YouTube which was a meeting with like IXP and uh, some dude from Ink Packers, didn't it? They were talking about the deployment of like BGPB across Europe. So. Uh, I, I know that it's widely used, but I don't have those numbers. I'm too far, am I not? Yeah. Exactly fast hardware no, of that fast. time. Of that time, it's a couple of years ago. It was bigger for reason than fast hardware. Okay, so that's at minimum packet size that's less than half of the. Oh, of course, of no, course, yeah. of course. For for routers and anything forwarding traffic, bandwidth is not all that interesting. It's packets yeah, right, per right, second. Right, that's yeah. my point here is you're sort of, you, you imply yeah. that you can build something approaching a 10 gig proper yep. router out of both of these. No, but. Yeah. To use your word, that is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, this, sorry, I'll quote you correctly. This is a lie. I, I, said, I said you won't headroom. So you won't yeah. run this if you actually run 10 gigabits, but up until whatever, 5, 6, 7, you'll be fine. Um, the 600,000 is from a couple of years ago, that hardware. Since then, we did a number of changes that, that improved performance a lot. So today, with all these improvements and current hardware, it should be at least twice as much. Well, let's, let's see what we are comparing with. Um, a Cisco 12000, which costs more than 100,000 euros, cannot handle 5,000 packets a second if they don't manage to hit their fast path. If they're not the fast path, yes. Exactly, which right. is trivial to do when I'm the attacker. No, trivial. Actually, all you, need to, all you need to do is to set a random IP option which has to be ignored by, by the spec, and they, they will not hit the fast path and they're fucked. No, I'm, I'm, I'm using the same method, methods here that they do, like to make the numbers somewhat comparable. So I was, I was running a uh, open, open BSD uh, without OpenBGP as the core router for open networks, and I was seeing well over five gigabits of real traffic. Sure, I know. Okay. Yeah. Granted, there would be a yeah. distribution of, of packet size that yeah. would be something yeah. above a gigabit. I completely but agree. Everybody Packets per second. Right. It's, it's PPS. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. That's the main thing we're looking at. Absolutely. Okay. The but cost is per packet, not per byte. Absolutely. But now, if I'm, giving, if I'm giving the numbers for 64 byte packets and everybody else is giving the numbers for 1500, this. Yeah, bleh. I mean, we don't they lie. We know how they lie. It's, it's so, you know. Call you on lies, damn lies, benchmarks, marketing. <laughs> uh, I think you were first. Um, since we are not modifying it all that much anymore, I actually don't. I have several other routers around. Um, last not least, I just run it in production. I'm not very afraid of trying something on the core routers either because it's all redundant. It's seamless failover. So good enough. Uh, Claudio has a little lab as well. Um, I think he forgot to take this off. <laughs> <laughs> so, when are you going to switch your focus on foreign 
that's a very good question. We want we want to do this for several years, and every time we, every time Claudio and I sit down and want to do it at some hackathon, there's something else that interrupts us, and then we do something else. So I'm not making any prediction there. What should I do about it? Case by case. I mean, there's no universal answer to implement everything that's been proposed or to reject everything that's been proposed. It's just really a case by case thing. Feature complete with the stuff people ask for. Like the, the last big thing that we've been asked for and that we did not have were the BGP MPLS VPN stuff, which we have for a long time now. I don't remember any feature request for, to implement some standards thing or the like over the last couple of years. I have one. RPK AI. Yes, you wanted to code RPK that. AI RPR. But you wanted to code that. Sorry? You said you will code that. Remember in Tokyo? I said I might have thought about it. About <laughs> 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 Which means you're writing it. No, I. I know this. I know this approach. Well, I work, I work you, on the he attempts side. it. He attempts it. He sends a horrible patch <laughs> and expects us to fix it. We apply the same technique. It usually works. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I'm on the other side of the fence for the reason for why the, the, the data about that. So, uh, uh, so our pick, our pick, RPKI, that's basically signed, signed route updates. So um, to yeah, verify that the guy who's announcing the route actually is allowed to, uh, makes a lot of sense. Oh, okay. uh, not for the moment. Because nobody's implementing it. It's, it's like the NSSEC, it's like IPv6. No, it's different because the NSSEC completely sucks. No, I mean, sorry, for DNSSEC, we want the feature, but the proposed, the proposed solution is bullshit. I understand, but let's say from my point of view, I maintain the IPv6 course for the NCC, I maintain the DNSSEC course, and I worked on our, our RPKI, so all the three things I do in my life, it's shit for me. No, I said, R, I said RPKI makes sense. What was the first? DNSSEC, uh, IPv6, RPKI. Yeah, so one, of, one, one out of three is good. Re refocus. <laughs> so it, instead of handing this incomprehensible bullshit out, implement RPKI. It's not all that hard. It's just okay. C code. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions, or can we go for beer yet? Oh, I, I don't drink. <laughs> can, can we go for soda? <laughs> Tea. Okay, thank you then.